So we should show up any time at all. We should show up any time at all. Looks like we're almost ready to stream. It takes a couple of minutes. I'm so going to kill the audio. Hang on. Uh, so we got a stream going out, stream coming in. We got 2000 on the Adobe. Let me kill it. And we're streaming anyway. Hopefully. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good evening. Yeah, it's a surprise. It's so not a good one, but it's a surprise. Um, just give me a second, make sure I'm streaming. That was supposed to disappear. The Adobe. Let me try it again. The Adobe is supposed to disappear. So I am cruising. So it's not an optional stream. Is it streaming? I don't know if this is streaming or not. The video never disappeared like it was supposed to. It takes a few seconds to get up and streaming. This appears to be no different. And if that don't work, we'll go over to live stream and work on this again later. Uh, Am I streaming? Am I streaming? I'll put a comment out there just in case people are wondering what the hell I'm doing here. So, don't look like I'm streaming. Looks like I got problems. I see me moving around. So I guess I am streaming. They're streaming. Okay. Well, I was supposed to get rid of the stream that's on the screen and it didn't disappear. Just give me one second. Because there's a stream coming in and a stream going out, right? Rock and roll. Yeah, all's good. All's fine on YouTube. Okay, I'm going to get rid of that one. Come back over here, open live chat in the new window. Okay, I get the live chat over here. That'll work. That'll work. Hang on folks. Bear with me. I know it's not I'm not even supposed to be here today, but I'll explain that coming up. I'll explain why I'm here too. Good morning, good evening everybody, just cruising. Yeah, I'm streaming. I'll work out the details later on. We went out in the boat and uh, Zoe was acting funny. She started having seizures and she passed away uh, about two hours later. And so, uh, she's 15 years old and so we, she had a stroke a couple of weeks ago. We were expecting that. That was my doggy. People not familiar about this, and don't want to alarm people for undue reasons. But Zoe was the expedition for life in every sense of that word. She made sure I got up all day, every day, many times, <laughs> and she kept me company that whole time. And so she's 15 years old. And she didn't suffer too bad. It was pretty rough on me, but. And so I'm back in port, and we put her in in the garden here. I got a friend of mine to come by and help me. And so I wanted to get that out of the way before I talk about nuclear nuclear crimes and everything else, because I know how important that the things we do are and so 
it's important to me anyway that I come out and I talk about that. Now, um, we'll move on, skip on. Not that that'll ever go away from me. And, you know, I had no idea, and I'll just end it on that, but I had no idea the suffering people can go through just for their pets till the day. I, I had empathy, you know, for people in that position, but I had no concept of it. Like anybody else, right? And it's just, you know, most people say it's just a pet. And I get that too. And, it's, you know, I've lost loved ones, don't get me wrong, but this is something that I protected for 15 years. And so, you know, the nuclear industry could have poisoned her and she could have died of natural causes. And it's really straightforward like that. Uh, you know, when you consider what they've done to me, it's easy to believe they killed her to get rid of her because she's such a good watchdog, such a good guard dog. And it's something that I feared uh, dramatically. And she puked up two times this morning, and when I got up this morning, I had to puke right out of the blue. And so that was really weird. It was a weird combination, you know what I mean? But regardless, um, I'm going to wait till next later the week or next week or next year or who knows what before I go back out on the ocean. And so that took the good out of me for that one. I went to escape the misery and and I, I brought it on myself, so to speak. It'll be a bit noisy for a second. And so nuclear, for people that are not familiar, has a long history. And of course, it's always pictures over the nuclearproctologist.org. You'll find her. She was on the expedition. <laughs> she's she's in every set of picture many times because she wanders into the shot all the time, right? And so she, and she'll never go away. I always thought of her as a mascot, in one sense, for the hounds of Fukushima, and I always thought of her as really special. And so that's why I'm here today, because I realized that if I didn't come out and blog. I might lose that spirit too. And so, to come out and blog is not easy, obviously, especially when you're you're going to talk about stuff like that. It's hard on everybody. My apologies. Not that it's needed, I know. But it's hard on everybody when you weren't expecting something like that. And, that's to, and I mean, there's so many people out there who have lost everybody in their family right here, right now in the chat room. And I'm not equating it with something like that, of course. What I am equating it with is that that was that was my backbone. That she kept my six all the time, and you know I was extremely good to her, unbelievably good right till the very end. So there's no uh, there's no um, I don't wish that I'd done anything different in that context, right? But I am worried that it could have been a nuclear industry getting rid of her because that's notorious for the nuclear industry to, to kill the, the foes they're after to kill their dogs. And so in the back of my mind, that always plays too, right? And that is the reality that we live in that because I'm the number one provider of documentation and information on nuclear, period. There's nothing else out there can touch us. I say me, I know, but it's us. But it is me who sits in front of the camera. It is me who aggregates all the information. But it was all of us on that ocean this morning, I can assure you. And that's what it was for the whole trip. It was all of us. That's what kept the whole trip alive. And so anybody's not familiar with that, let me switch gears for a second. And this is the boat we were on this morning. And... She's in the garden, the boat is in the garden, they're fully loaded. And what we've done, we've done uh, 15,000 miles of the coastline. Now we're going to talk about nuclear crimes coming up here very quick, but I just want to set the stage. Now we've done 15,000 miles of the coastline, and instead of looking like that throughout the coastline, it looked like uh, this. And so these are from the same places, at the very top of the chart. With the arrows to your um, 
the red arrows at the top of it, that island, is a uh, Haida Gwaii, Queen Charlotte. It still says Queen Charlotte on that one. Uh, but that's where these pictures came from anyway. That's pre-Fukushima, 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 post-Fukushima, coming up, post-Fukushima, post-Fukushima, post-Fukushima. And the enormity of what was there is staggering when you get up close and personal. And now now there's nothing left there. And so we we said that, we done that. Let's get, keep going here. Yes, Elaine, you would know the pain, though. I, I'm sure you lost two pets. Uh, not to mention your loved ones in, in the worst possible ways but yeah no like that's what I say so many people out there none of us escaped that I'm sure at this stage of our lives that 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 life is not fair and life is cruel but it doesn't have to be that way like the the, the public relations firms don't have to go out there and cover up the mass murderers or the crazies, or the maniacals, or the demented, because they're influential, or celebrities, or corporations, yeah? And so, that is why though, because we don't hold anybody to count, is why there's so much agony and misery, and heartaches and heartbreaks on this planet. The majority of people, they live their life, and they have their own, they're gonna have their own heartaches in their own lives, right? Children are being born, children are raised, and unfortunately sometimes children die before the parent, and nothing could be worse. Totally different uh, game than what I'm talking, not a game, but a totally different reality than what I'm talking about today in, in my personal world. But on the flip side, you know, I worry the nuclear industry was trying to kill us, with good reason. And that I always feared she would be targeted because they're heartless and soulless. And I say that with good faith. I say that with uh, well sourced, with a big foundation. And just so you can appreciate what I'm talking about, when it comes to killing dogs and dogs dying, this guy, he is a misery machine. This is Loveless, Dr. Raymond Gilmetty from Loveless Respiratory Research Institute. He has 94 peer review studies. He has 94 peer review studies killing beagle dogs and beagle puppies. And so he would sit there and watch my heartaches this morning and laugh about it. Uh, but I would never laugh about it happening to somebody else. And that's why I bring him up all the time is because when you look at the studies of the dogs, when you look at those studies of 144 dogs and you see how Within uh, 1.5 years to 5.4 years, which is where we're up to now, tumors of the lung, skeleton, and liver occur beginning about three years after exposure. Bone tumors found in 93 dogs were the most common cause of death. Lung tumors found in 46 dogs were the second most common cause of death. And now these dogs, they suffered like, not Zoe didn't suffer only for a few hours this morning, but she didn't suffer her 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 whole life, right? Dr. Raymond Gilmetti, he wasn't able to give the dogs, not that he would, but he wasn't able to give the dogs painkillers or something like that because that would screw up uh, the test, right? So the animals are that I sh we were just talking about, that was vicious cancers, that was a vicious death, and the long prolonged, prolonged, or prolonged suffering and it's rumored they would cut the vocal cords out of the dogs anyway, once they got to a certain stage, because even they couldn't deal with it. And, but lots of them could, of course, because they go up and hit the dog and tell the dog to stop whining because it's in pain, right? That's what these people are like. That's what Dr. Raymond Gilmetti from Loveless Respiratory Research Institute is actually truly like. Yeah, thank you, Elaine. Thank you, everybody. Just cruising. Lawrence. Hi everybody, Joseph, and Lawrence, thanks Lawrence for your emails, I see him buddy, Pasha, and Kate is here, Mr. Thunder Barker, Thunder, I haven't got my glasses on, 
Good morning, everyone. Anybody I didn't get to, my apologies. Atom was there. He said he was he couldn't share the he couldn't share the bandwidth because he had a because two of them on the bandwidth down there, which is fine, of course. And you don't have to comment around my sites, folks. It's not mandatory, but it does add to the conversation, and it does keep the. Thank you, Joseph. Kate. It is so. Yeah, it's a terrible loss. And I, w I won't be able to get another dog. I couldn't go through something like that again. But in one sense, now that she's gone, that frees me up to do, to work five times as hard. Definitely for quite a long time coming up, so I gotta burn off the misery and meat some way. And and I realize, you know, it's just you know it's coming. You can see it in the last couple of weeks there was something really bad going on. Done everything you could do, but on the flip side You know, I got a couple of thousand pictures of her, so I'm extremely happy and she traveled the coastline with me and I'm extremely happy for that so she had her last couple of years were fantastic you know, years for a dog incredible years for a dog no dog was ever loved like that dog I can assure you or, or treasured or coveted like that dog has been and everybody who knows me in my personal life knows that about the dog and she can do no wrong she didn't the, the, the model you're looking at alongside of me, see this is the thing, right, is that because there's so much fallout, because the lies are so big, because the crimes are so many, because the crimes are so vicious and violent, committed by the nuclear industry, that the suffer suffering is real. That the people who are, are the victims of the nuclear industry from living too close to a nuclear power plant, and where 22% of the children within a 15 mile range uh, would have, uh, I'm sorry, 22% more cancer for children, killer cancer leukemias within a 15 mile. And then if you're a woman in that same distance, uh, you're six times more likely to get breast cancer, vicious breast cancer. You know, see, it's only true misery sometimes that we, we, we can see the other side a little tiny bit of what it's like for the rest of the people out there. It's only at those vulnerable moments in your life where you're impacted in such a way that you can... Right? And that's, that's what a lot, a lot of viral videos are, where the video is something everybody can relate to as somebody... But not, not understanding that we're all there, we're all in that we're all in that same spot. We all have that same, I think we do anyway, we all have that that emotional capacity to be able to, to carry on, but to be able to reflect and mourn it properly. In the sense of, when you think about, how about the poor victims that, you know, are alongside a nuclear waste dump or were in the way of the fallout or lived close to the nuclear power plant and where the emissions were coming into their communities, their water. And, and, and so, you know, these people, their misery was much more than what mine was and is today, right? It's much, much deeper, much more long lasting, much more vibrant, much more painful in every sense of those words. But it's that epiphany of losing my doggy this morning that really drives it. See, that was missing in, like my mom died of cancer and she was full of it. The cancer right to her. And so I flew back to the East Coast uh, several years back, eight years ago for that funeral. They kept her on uh, life support till I got there. But it's, see, you know, you forget stuff like that because it's far removed in one sense you can't because you don't have the 
when I look at nuclear, I look at an extinction event, like I showed you the pictures earlier. See, that's what I see. I see this this extinction event, and we've done the whole coastline looking at this extinction event where the 4.2 million other species and all the birds and all the insects and everything were down to tiny, tiny parts per million, literally and figuratively. And then I tied up in every community along the coastline and I talked to the locals. And they told me about the cancers. And you know, I sympathize with that, but not, not the same way as I would this morning if I was told that again, right? If I was to encounter that person and find out that that was going on in our community. It's that awakening that we, we all dread and we all, we all deal with it differently. Well, the only way I can deal with it is to be better, to be more astute, to be more articulating, to be more, I don't know if you want to call it bold, but to be more, um, more thoughtful, I think is the better word for it, is how I see it. Because I, I, I can be me and that's fine. But it's it's those thoughtful things in our lives that impact us the most, isn't that? It's the thoughtful things in life that we all resonate with. It's the little things in life that someone might do for you or someone might say for you that can carry you for your decades. Is how that's how life works. So the, the nuclear industry. Because everywhere it goes, it creates murder. It's in your hospital injecting your loved ones who are in, you know, everybody is suffering and in misery and agony. And they bring their loved ones to a hospital with all these high expectations that they got the best medicine, they got the best equipment, they got the best facilities, you know, compared to a third world country or anywhere else, particularly like North America. But what we do here in North America is we take nuclear waste after we get the loved ones to sign a piece of paper and then we murder their loved ones. And then their loved ones don't understand. They don't understand why the suffering was so intense and why it was so miserable. And so many of us out there can speak to that in our own personal lives. I know that. I know it's a painful subject for everyone. But it's those epiphanies, no different than a wheel was an epiphany for somebody at some time. And look where that got us today, or where a phone was an epiphany for somebody at some time. Look where that got us today. <laughs> I know we can flip that. <coughs> and grief is, has always been an epiphany. Grief, grief has always been the forefront of just about all the major decisions ever made on this planet. And the misery came after, you know. Like with war, see, I, this is why I talk about that all the time. With war, I see 5 million orphans and I see 10,000 Taliban and I can't reconcile that. How do we end up with 5 million refugee or uh, orphans to get 10,000 bad guys? But that was Afghanistan, then we, I mean, millions dead, millions missing, millions in refugee camps, millions unaccounted for. The pensions are gone, destroyed. The patents are gone in the country, destroyed. And the only people who won the war there was Monsanto. They can't even grow their own indigenous uh, plants and food. They had to grow Monsanto for the next two decades. They went to Iraq and done the exact same thing to get the same 10,000 gangbangers. Right? And so, most people, they call them ragheads or they say uh, brown people or they say, they find the cliche to uh, dehumanize them. Is, is, see, I, that, that's why I bring that up all the time, why I have that rhetoric I have, why I have that narrative I had as my narrative. All of that is, that's why I exist. It's like, I have these epiphanies and I, I string them together and I detail them. I make sure they're legitimate. And then I can tell you, millions dead, millions missing, millions in refugee camps, millions of orphans, millions unaccounted for, they get 10,000 bad guys. That if you shoot them, they'll die just as easy as you if you got shot. No different. They're not superhuman. They're illiterates on top of that. Where me and you would get, you know, 
we clean the wound really good, blah, blah, blah. Most of these people wouldn't care less. They just throw old rags on it and they live that life. See, they don't appreciate life because they destroy life for a living. But a lot of them don't do it understanding it. A lot of them join the military not thinking it's a career, or thinking it's a job, thinking they never show up in war, not understanding why or, or the legacy of the military. And the military, of course, is heavily involved in nuclear. And what did they do with all their waste for years and years and years and years and decades, for the last seven decades, is they hired their own, took the money and took a ship, and went out and scuttled it full of nuclear waste and went away with all the money. And then they went to a war in a country and they shot everybody. And then one of their commanders had them killed because they knew where all the nuclear waste was dumped. That's what the whole industry is about. Every time they dump nuclear waste, they have to get rid of the patsies because they can tell where it's to. And so, it's not just war predicated upon misery and agony and you know, 10,000 Taliban. Then we went where? We went to Libya, Somalia. We went to um, Syria where we got 13 million refugees. And they can't go back because we blew up every building, every telephone pole, every bridge, every set of steps, every wall. We wrecked the entire country to get 10,000 ISIL, which are a branch of the Taliban. So at this rate for 10,000 people, not only that, we're groping 700 million people a year in the airports because we're worried about a Taliban might get on a plane. It's just this nonsense. We created 5 million orphans. You can expect a few of them looking for revenge. No matter how you, if you went and gave them all a million dollars each and said you're sorry, a few of them are going to be looking for revenge. That's just the way the world works. That's the way the world comes across. And that's what the world understands. Because that's what it's fed. It's spoon fed that all the time. The nuclear industry is the biggest part of any war. It depleted uranium munitions from McAllister's bomb manufacturing uh, facility in, in McAllister, Oklahoma. And so there are 1,800 people, and that's all they make is dirty bombs. But we're afraid to death someone's going to get a dirty bomb and come over here. But we fired 5.7 rounds a month, every month, to get 10,000 bad guys for nine years. Then we look at uh, during that same nine years, there was 290,000 rapes in the military. 29,000 a year in the military, raping our own. No one supports them. Trust me, no one supports those. We only support the people that came back after killing a bunch of women and children and destroying villages. A jet pilot flies over the country. He don't see nothing. He's got someone on the ground with a laser and he drops his missile, veers away, and the, wherever that guy on the ground with the laser, that's where that missile's going. But yet, we put them up on pedestals. We fly them through our cities, we fly them on tour around our country and we put them up on pedestals. As, but who are they going to go up and dogfight against? Who is it? What is a jet fighter ever going to go up and fight against? Those days are gone. We moved into the laser era. We've been at it for 50 years. And You know, the nuclear industry, it doesn't know how to play fear. It doesn't care about you or your friends or your families or your loved ones or anybody in their own family. They don't think about, I'm sorry, they don't, they don't have that emotion that is the backbone of the moral compass. And so they can't get a job unless they don't have that they're missing that part of their brain where the moral compass originates from. Or they're missing that part of the brain where when someone screams in agony, they don't look to see if they can help. 
or they they live in that world where nothing matters to them only this satanic worshipping of the cult of death and where they see nuclear as a way to kill a vast numbers of people without uh, getting their hands dirty per se but still enabling that to happen and so let me let me just expand on that for a minute so a nuclear power plant boils off radioactive material into your community they say it doesn't matter because the EPA and IRPA and UNSCLEAR and all of these said it's okay to let this much radiation into your community is not harmful but see if you go back and look at the agreement if you look at Dr. Raymond Gilmetti's studies on beagle dogs and beagle puppies you'd understand where I'm coming from but if you look at the original doctrines the charters of these corporate personhoods is that they they promised nothing would escape the plant they would they promised nothing would uh, migrate out of, the, out of the, the zone that they have set up and they promised that the, there was a solution to the nuclear waste and that uh, they had it and that they were going to implement it and so we gave them licenses for nuclear and what they've done in increments over the last number of decades is not only have they took the nuclear waste right off the site and then put it in your community dumps and put it in, in holes in the ground and then sold that to companies or, or housing managements and built apartments and complexes on it or where they had playgrounds built above it or they had provincial parks and county parks and stuff like that right over the nook so all the people trying to get away from life working like five days a week or six days a week and raising families and paying the bills and, and scraping and so they go hang out in the park with their loved ones and that was the worst thing could happen to them that come back and then they had to liquidate their assets 20 30 years later to to try to find comfort for their loved ones who are suffering and we all know somebody in our own life or our friends lives who, who went through that and we know what the enormity of it is what it means but some people go through it and it doesn't impact them some people go through it and they benefit off it in the context of they never had an emotional attachment like an average person would have to their loved ones and so they you know whatever right so I'm, I'm talking about you know I'm talking about people that have a history of being emotionless that work in an emotionless industry that wear emotionless clothes and drive an emotionless um, life you know around them and but make a lot of money working safe for the government most of these people are applicable and so their job was to by the, by the community, by the province, by the state, by the country, the government employees, government, the government employees job was to help people in the community, was to go that extra distance, was to say, hey, look, we got someone here who fell through the cracks. But no, that's not what they do. What they do is they take their stable guns and knock off stables at each other, and then they bring the stable gun home at the end of the day and put it in their kids' room. And then they give them, when the kids grow up, they give them the gas card from the government. And these computers, they steal automobiles. They, they don't do the work they're assigned to do. And nobody can fire them. And in order to get that job and stay in that job, you have to be psychologically damaged. You have to be psychologically detached from emotions. But what I'm basically trying to say is we filled up our the most vital positions in our society have been filled up uh, by these people who worked really hard to get there a lot of them a lot of them were just grandfathered in because they were inbreeds of the inbreeds of the inbreeds and that nobody gets to apply for those government jobs even though you're supposed to because the inbreeds control that whole and so a way of looking at it like that I guess is um, here's another way to look at it so Newfoundland where I'm from when the fishery collapsed what they done was the, the federal government gave they closed the fishery and they gave Newfoundland and Labrador uh, 10 billion dollars 
Now, that money was to re-kick the economy. But what happened was two million people, out of two and a half million, and I'm one of them, left that province. But the reason that happened was because the government employees were taking the money and creating jobs to hire their friends and their families and their loved ones and their children. And so now, right now, Newfoundland, 29% of the people who work for a check in Newfoundland go to work every day in a government office. But they don't have any money. Their budget only pays their wages, see? They don't have money to put into the community. So the $10 billion that was supposed to keep the 2 million people in the province, including me, was stolen and then was siphoned and then was redistributed to accommodate their friends, their families, and their loved ones so they didn't move away. And so now you have an economic there that 30% almost of the people, 29% of the people, are dependent upon the taxpayers, the rest of the people, to pay all of their expenses and their credit cards, the government credit cards, and the government vehicles, and the government boats, and the government this, and the government that, and government everything else that they got access to. But they shouldn't exist. There should only be, at tops, around 4% of those employees. The rest should be fired. But ultimately, they will wreck that province. And every kid for decades will leave that province because they can't find a job because all the jobs are taken up by this handful of people that misappropriated the money. But no one can hold them accountable because they're the government. They're the ones who are supposed to hold themselves accountable. Well, that's exactly what happened with the nuclear industry. All the money that was going to be allocated was stolen. All the money for security, like billions of dollars for people to walk around with a gun on. Do you get that? Do you understand that? Can you wrap your mind around that? Do you, do you, like this is true. Where each nuclear power plant is getting somewhere between a half a billion and a billion dollars for security each year, if not a lot more than that. And what are they guys, like six guys with guns? No one has ever tried to steal something from a nuclear power plant. And the stuff you need, if you steal it, it'll kill you within about 40 minutes. Just from the x-rays and the neutrons, even if it's in a container. And by the way, there's no such thing as a sarcophagus. So all, like the nuclear industry, the crimes of the nuclear industry, wherever they have these sarcophaguses that are allegedly containing the isotopes, if they do that, the isotopes, which are noble gases, are man-made. They're nothing like nature. They're very dangerous. These isotopes have to be vented because noble gases will detonate. They don't need a spark. They just need a little bit of oxygen. And then you have a radiological uh, nightmare. So the WIP uh, waste repository, which was underground, uh, they had a, a detonation there. They blamed it on a truck fire and then 10 days later, they said there was also a release. But they never admitted that no one went down in the mine for 10 days because of a truck fire that didn't happen. They never went down in the mine for 10 days because there was a radiological release. That one of the canisters, one of the sarcophagus, allegedly that they got, they, they, they vent all of them. And so those, where do you think those radionucleoids are going to go to? The majority of them, in my opinion only, about 60, 60 to 70 percent of them are going to land within a disposition of about 50 miles. And we know that 50 miles is very real from the disposition that we understand and that we modeled. And we know it go a lot further than that too. We know the steam from a nuclear power plant created snow for 35 miles in a straight line in adverse conditions. Now that snow was radioactive. So they take the reactor core and they put it on the roof in what they call a fuel pool. It's a reactor pool. They call it fool's pool. They call it depleted uranium at that stage. But it's not depleted. You can put it through a, a very expensive process and you got nuclear fuel again. It's just it can't run the chain reaction in the big mass that because they so-called used up the energy. Now, a gram of it got a million watts. And each rod is 18 pounds. <clears throat> it's a stupid amount of... Like, it's an amazing thing, but you're going to get 400 train cars of iron ore and, and break that down with harsh chemicals, 400 train cars of chemicals and a million train cars of water 
and you break all that down, everything left over, all of that is left over, and anything you take taken away from that is one gram. One gram. Size of a doin. And so everything is hemorrhaging into the environment, all those chemicals. It's just a whole process of nuclear. Every, there's 15,000 of those mines with those tailing ponds full of incredible, harsh, dangerous, vicious chemicals. And the industry just runs away and leaves it there. Everything about it, every step of it, every, every time it opens its mouth on top of that, it lies. It has to. It can't survive. It can't tell the truth. It can't say it's not like a banana. It cannot do that. A nuclear scientist cannot come out, a sitting professor at a university, and, and kick up a big fuss and say, hey, wait a second, that's a lie, folks, because it's actually like, it's dangerous. It's not like a banana. That can never happen. If that happened, you would take down every university on the planet that deals with nuclear. You would take down every pundit in the media in the one swift kick. Just like that, it'd all fall apart. Everybody would be going like, wait, what a second. You said it was like a banana for 70 years. Now you're saying it's actually dangerous. And I live right by a nuclear plant. I can see people out there all over the world saying that right away. That is how that works. They can't tell you the truth. They got to keep reinforcing the lie. That's all they can do. They don't. They can't come up with something new because everybody will notice it and that'll create a blowback. So they got to tell you the same thing. It's like a banana. It's like a potato chip. It's like walking in the sunshine. It's like getting on an airplane, etc., etc., etc. It's like natural, normal, everyday radiation. They have to say that till the end of time. There is no way around that. It's like. They don't tell you there's five million orphans or millions dead. They don't tell you all the infrastructure is gone in, in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria and Libya. And how many refugees all together total would that be? Uh, that's 18 million and 13 million. So 31 million refugees to get 10,000 gangbangers. Not only that, the real numbers, see? Because there's millions missing. They're presumed dead. They're presumed slaughtered. Only because you're a foreign... 5.5 million rounds a month from the troops and then you're one bomb a minute a 500 pound 3,000 pound bomb every minute for nine years but you see a headline the other day where America is running out of bombs they only made tw they only used 20,000 last year or something do you got any idea how big of a lie that really truly is how demented. They use 5.5 million rounds a month every month for nine years. Do you think they're just going to say, nah, nah, we, you know, we, we, we shot everything up, we're going to stop producing bombs and bullets? No, of course not. But see, that's the law you're fed. But that is the danger of no one, of not being able to trust any of your institutions or any opponents or any of the experts, particularly the experts. Like Unsclear and IRPA and um, Atomic Energy, IAEA, all of the radiation technological protection agencies, all of them, their total membership is not 50,000, even though it should be. Their membership is 100. It's the same 100 people that, and they're all on the same boards. The, the, the whole thing is rigged because they know if the truth comes out just once, they're done. And so they control the media, they control the universities, they control the Senate, they control the appropriation hearings when it comes to nuclear. And they strong arm them if they got to. They blackmail them if they got to. They have all kinds of spy networks. They have the CIA, the FBI. We have CSIS here in Canada, Canadian Secret Intelligence Services. And they, they got away with waterboarding children because they were using Dr. Pepper basically. When these are thugs, these are criminals, these are the inbreeds that are, are rootless, that are scrupulous, that are unbelievable, maniacal, but got a job because of who their father was because he was just like them. And so they were recruited in because they were cold hearted. They were dark, like dots, like connecting dots on, on YouTube. They were dark like him and heartless and soulless and despicable. But all your universities are, are, have those same attributes, it's those same people. 
rely upon the same organizations to puke up their nonsense to the students and everybody else. It's just frightening that this system of uh, anti-brain power, uh, stupid power, is controlling so many aspects of our world. Like, think about taking your loved one to a hospital, putting your fate into a system, and having man-made ionizing, who knows what the concoctions, the cocktails, the, the, the pancreas is that they're putting in there, the mixture of isotopes from a chain reaction. And the loved ones had to sign a piece of paper saying, whether they read it or not, it says that you cannot sue the institution or the, the, the faculty or the members or the staff or anybody else if your loved one dies from those treatments. And it says in very big letters, these are experimental treatments subject to change. And how you know, so many of us have went down this road with our loved ones, not understanding till it's too late, and there's nothing we can do about that. Only hold them accountable. Only change what they're doing. Only address what, even that, just address that we're injecting nuclear waste in our loved ones. And when we inject, nu put nuclear waste into animals, what happens? Well, with the dog studies, 144 dogs, they all died within 5.4 years. He'd done that for 35 years. So do you really think injecting nuclear waste into your loved one is any different when they're already at their... But, but that's what we're told. We're told to go do that. We're encouraged to go do that. We hear that in the media. So-and-so's getting chemotherapy. So-and-so's getting treatment at the nuclear facility, nuclear science lab at an institution. right? But we don't hear about Dr. Raymond Gilmany. We don't hear that side of it. It's on purpose. A journalist would say, okay, well, let's go see what, what other people do with nuclear waste besides injecting it into our children and our friends and our families and our loved ones and murdering them with it. Because your hospital is a misery machine, like I feel today, like I felt this morning, like I'm sure it will never go away from me. But that, that intenseness, that, that agony, that, that despondence, that I, I, I understand so well, again, that's real. That's terrible. That's unnecessary. That's immoral. That's reprehensible. That we do that to our friends and our families and our loved ones. And that they do it to our friends and families and loved ones. And that they try to find other ways to do it to our friends and families and loved ones. And that they know what they're doing, they won't give it up. They won't stop. They won't stop until they destroy everything. Just like they destroyed the Pacific Ocean, killed it already in five years from Japan's melter reactors. They won't stop. They won't give it up. They won't, they won't stop. And they're, they understand what they're doing. They know. Right? James Hansen, when he tells you people at Three Mile Island got the same amount of uh, radiation as you would from flying across the country, He's not naive or gullible by saying that. He's not stupid. He's not misinformed. He's telling you, a, he, he was wondering which, he, he was stuttering, trying to figure out which law he was going to say. Was it like a banana, potato chip, or flying across the country? But he knows he's not going to say it's dangerous, or it's harmful, or it's brutal. Or look at Dr. Raymond Gilmetti's study. He's not going to say something like that. He's going to say it's like a banana or a potato chip. But yet James Hansen is one of the most coveted people on the planet. He's quoted verbatim in all the major freak shows out there. All the mainstream media will quote him no matter if he farts. Woo! It was wonderful. But what he's doing is he's creating, he's creating this force field of people who put their fate in them to not look at something else. To not even try to look at another, if it clashes with what they said, then it must be bad. If you're saying it's bad, but he's a, a well-known scientist, he's a well-known scientist. Well, Dana, he's been killing beagle dogs for 35 years. He doesn't say nuclear is bad. 
No, because you, you'll say, well, you're a monster killing beagle dogs for 35 years and puppies. Like, they don't kill dogs without killing puppies too at the same time. They, they kill older dogs, younger dogs, they're at the whole range. And then you have two or three other laboratories that they don't know what the names of them are with the same number and type of dogs, give them the same, uh, same amounts, the mono dispersals, the same, the same uh, metrics, so that they can be independent studies. And so you, you can't, this guy is killing dogs for 35 years with the same stuff you're injecting into your children and your friends and your families when you take them to the hospital to be treated for cancer. Now the doctor who's giving it to them at the hospital and the nurses, they don't understand nuclear. They're not trained to understand man-made radiation at all. I've watched I've watched uh, lectures where they where somebody was saying we should put out. Now this was pro nuclear, and someone happened to say we got to teach doctors about man-made radiation, and the other guy was basically saying, "What are you stupid? We like them just like they are." Because then they could say, "Well, this will this kills everybody but two percent of the people right away. They don't live any longer than they would have." 98% of the people were diagnosed to live longer than they did if they didn't take the chemotherapy. So if they didn't take the chemotherapy, they would have lived longer. 98% murder rate. And the other 2% probably didn't have chemotherapy or didn't have cancer in the first place. They'll get them eventually, but they didn't have it in the first place. And so, you got Indian Point down by New York. New York, really huge. It's a very mobile, uh, very uh, transient type population in New York. New York, the rent is very expensive on purpose to keep people coming and going, to keep the wealthy coming and going. And so they're targeting the wealthy more so in New York than they are anywhere else, um, except for Japan. See, nuclear has an agenda. It's an ecocide and it's a genocide. And there's no, there's no little slippery slope here where it could be one or the other, uh, or couldn't be one or the other even. No. No matter how you try to paint nuclear, it comes up as a vicious murderer, and it never goes away. It'll be here long after the human experience, and that the fallout just from Japan's reactors it's still ongoing. It's never going to stop. Even if it stopped right now, it would take a, a thousand years for it to rain out of the upper and lower troposphere. What's already up there? This stuff has gone into space from Fukushima. Now, see, it's hard for people to wrap their mind around that. Let me wrap my. Let me help you wrap your mind around it. These models that don't mean much to you, right? That's an ocean model. The reactors are right on the ocean. And here's some other models. Here's Noah's model. That was hit away for a long time. Here's many models of the ocean. But all of them models are only based up on a couple of days releases from a single reactor. It's not even based up on the meltdowns or the melt-throughs or the melt-out or the cannibalization of all the steel and rebar and ionizing and atomizing and aerosoling and, and radiating of those. It's only based upon two days venting. Apparently someone from Tevco went ran in there during a tsunami that took out 400 kilometers of the coastline. Let me explain that though. Here's a good model to think about. I'm going to bring it up and make it bigger for a second. Just bear with me. See, this model is based upon XC133 which is unusual, yeah? But Japanese, Japan is on the right-hand side, the bottom right-hand corner, and North America is on the left-hand side. So, the date on that is the 11th. Let me try that again.
So, anyway, the, the point I'm trying to make to you, this is based up on a single plume. It stretches right across the ocean, and right across the continent, and right across the Atlantic. And it completely buries Japan. It completely buries China, and Vietnam, and the Philippines, and the Pacific Rim nations. It completely covers, but this is only based upon the modeling, it's only based upon a single isotope. Now, when you look at that model, I want you to think about nature. So potassium-40, if you took a gram of that, refined it down, got a gram of it, no big deal. I can show you mountains, mountains. I'm not kidding either. Man-made mountains of potassium-40. Mountains of it. Like in every country. Potassium-40 is good for you. And a gram of it is harmless. It's stupid. It's, man, it's idiotic. But that's used by the nuclear scientists. Now, what you're looking at on screen is based upon two days venting. And so a gram of man-made is called, uh, it's roughly 88 curries. And a curry is 37 billion atoms, dangerous atoms. Every atom can give you a cancer. So just 37 billion atoms is enough to give everything on the planet cancer. But 37 times 88, right? 37 billion times 88 is how much comes out of a gram of man-made. But a, 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 a gram of natural, which is not going to hurt you, even if you do got a gram, a gram of natural is about 160 atoms. It's not 88 times 37 billion, it's 160,000. So natural, 160,000, man-made, 88 times 37 billion. And so when, the, when that was released, they calculated how much of XE133 was there, and then they built a model based upon that release itself. And so the dispersal was just from venting because there was an, they said there was an issue. But in reality, in reality, that whole country was, was torn apart. Let me just pop that up and explain to you what the reactors are. Very quick for everybody that might be joining us on YouTube. And one of the strangest streams I've had yet. But it, I, I had this insight today, and I understood that I better do a video, even though I don't want to, I didn't want to, or uh, that I'm, I'm heartbroken, that I should do a video so that I can understand what what it is, so I don't lose touch with what it is that one thing in my life led to that I, I don't want to lose track of that part of my life. And so generally putting out, this is unit one, unit two, unit three, putting out these units, unit four. Look at them though. Look at unit three and look at unit four. Take into context that there was, hang on, the set Dorn says he's inside of unit four. Of the decommissioning work taking place here in Reactor 4. to go watch four. his documentary. But Unit 4, that's Unit 4. So you might ask yourself, is Seth and CBS and PBS, why would they do that? They're faking it, obviously. They're not inside of that building. But that is the legacy of the nuclear industry. Every single accident is treated that exact same way. Where the building is completely destroyed, and that's the official pictures. I'm showing you, including the one where he's inside the building. That's the official picture. But if you, but because you don't look, the average person is not going to go out and say, "Well, I got to go out and find out what the buildings look like after the accident," because I think there might be something wrong there. But the building looks perfect, so you wouldn't think something was wrong there. You kind of take their word for it. So when all the biggest uh, anti-nuclears out there came out and told you, the experts, the people who actually knew the difference, knew that it didn't, that it looked like that, and that it couldn't look like Seth Dorn is showing everybody. That was ludicrous. Once, once they, 
Once you look at that, that's how it was originally. Then they, they tore it down to this. Then they got it to deer. And then Seth Dorn came out and said, hey. Of the decommissioning here am, had taking four. place here Four's in Reactor four. 4. Miles O'Brien went down there. Before we left, he got a chest x ray too. Scanned, all of us, and checked the he was there for four hours. Along the way. And they got no more than the chest x ray. During our four and a half hour tour, a second. we absorbed as much radiation no as we x-ray. would have in a single chest x ray. If you went inside of that building, you do not come out. If you go into that building, you do not leave that site ever. You are nuclear waste. Now, Seth Dorn and them, Seth Dorn, and the crazies were there for how long? Decommissioning work. They were there for four hours and got a chest x ray because it, they weren't there, see? They weren't inside of that, they weren't inside of that. Now, think about the country. That's 400 kilometers of coastline, looks like this, because a tsunami came in and the tsunami took away everything. See, I know how she feels now, after this morning. I don't know 100%. I'll never know that. Nobody will ever know that. I get that. Because I know people will ninny pick me to death just to get at us. But I, I, today I get, I get her. And I did. I thought I really got her every time I showed that picture. But today I got her. Today I understand. And thank goodness I don't understand as good as she does. But I, I get it that there's something else here. There's something else there, see? That I didn't get, that I didn't recognize, that I didn't understand, that I wasn't able to to draw upon for energy and for stanima and for the moral compass itself. All of this was ignored. Now, they died. All those red numbers and red boxes you're looking at that is where, uh, that is the numbers of people who died. And that the yellow numbers are the numbers of the people that are missing. And that these are big numbers. And they died right in the same spot as the nuclear power plants. And they died in the same spots as the nuclear power plants because that came through their country. And because that ripped their country to pieces. And because there was no way to get power into the reactors. And even if you did get power into the reactor, how are you going to hook it up? What are you going to hook up to again? How are you going to hook up power to that? And so they never told you that. They hid that away from you. And they rolled out Seth Dorn. And they rolled out Miles O'Brien. And they rolled out Tepco with the great big loy. Okay, so... I'm just going to pop a couple of headlines. Rain with 20 million particles of radioactive iodine 131 per liter fell on the U.S. during post Fukushima. 20 million. 20 million per liter. Now people will say, Dana, iodine 131 and got an eight day half life. Stop your fear mongering. And that's the game. That's how they do it to you. And you're like, oh, it's only got an eight-day half-life, Dana's fear-mongering. And I agree with you, right? If that's all we had out there, it's still not fear-mongering because that, that could give you a thyroid ca killer cancer. I had a friend of mine who died a couple of years ago, shortly after Fukushima, uh, vicious thyroid cancer. It was vicious. And the gland died and rotted in his throat and killed him. And he married his three daughters off, though, before they got they finished with him. But he went to the hospital and they injected him with, he had other cancer, and they, they injected him with the nuclear waste and killed him. They killed him. All of his hair fell out. Two weeks later, he was dead. And we all know these stories. We all know these stories. I know that. Today I know it more so than any other day of my life, I'm sure. But I know that. I get that now. And I say it every day, but now today I get it. Today it has a new meaning for me. Today it has a new urgency for me. And for the rest of my life, it'll have, that urgency will never change. That, that somebody has to be out there 
trying to help people stop them from getting their loved ones murdered at hospitals. The hospitals don't even understand what they're doing. They think that person is a goner and that they're trying their best. They're, they're, they're indoctrinated in increments through all their education because they're just general practitioners and local nurses and stuff like that. They're not specialists in the context of working with nuclear management and nuclear waste and then moving into a nursing degree and trying to give people chemotherapy and understanding what it's all about. See, chemotherapy, you know, that sounds... We've been hearing this cliche for so long, right? But 2% of the people live any longer than they would have without it. And everybody loses their hair and gets violently sick. It kills all the cells in your body. Because man-made radiation, that's what it does. Nobody recovers from it. 2%, but they probably never even had the cancer when it started. See? There's 6 million people a year misdiagnosed or something in North America with cancers. But nuclear has killed the Pacific Ocean, has wrecked, has wrecked the future of this planet permanently, has destroyed the birds, on the coastline, the mammals, the animals, every species that we find in a mass find in a mass die off, it's starved to death. Every species. Whales, the big ninety foot whales go from twelve inches of blubber down to four inches and then and that's when we find them on the beaches. Think about the odds of finding two whales, finding a whale on a beach. That's a pretty low odd, okay? Finding two dead whales on the same beach the odds of that are extraordinary. It's the same thing with dead birds or any other marine animal. The odds of finding half a million birds and 337 whales, like we've seen those two in the last six months, seven months or so, the birds in the last month or so, the odds of finding that, you got better chances of getting hit by a Soviet satellite in three, two, one. Are you still there? Yeah. See, you have better odds. It's just because the odds are so astronomical. You know, three, two, one is is not. Now, cancer has been around since the dinosaurs. We got dinosaurs that got cancer, and so a lot of people say, "See, Dana, cancer's been around forever." Well, I got a simple explanation for that one. It's a really straightforward one. Tar pits have been around a lot longer. And animals that eat close to tar pits are eating carcinogenics. We, we know that petroleum products and, and carcinogens can cause vicious cancers if you're eating in that area a lot. That definitely will get you. But we know that cancer statistics in the last 20 or 30 years have went crazy. Now, in Japan, they say... You're finding more thyroid cancers because you're using more sophisticated technology and systems to look for it. Those same technologies are taken to other prefectures and other countries. And they don't find the massive increase like you find north of Tokyo. But nevertheless, you're still finding it. Because like the models I've shown you, Japan was contaminated immediately. It's not because they're using more sophisticated technology that we're finding more cancers is because radiation gives you cancer. It's because they know that Dr. Raymond Gilmetti studies. Does Dr. Raymond Gilmetti studies 94 studies killing beagle dogs and beagle puppies not just one at a time. Does that not mean nothing? Does, should that mean something to the radio, radiation experts? who have never, ever mentioned a hamster, let alone beagle dogs or beagle puppies, have never mentioned a mice treated with man-made radiation, have never mentioned anything on the planet. They say it's like a banana and a potato chip walking in the sunshine. They don't talk about Dr. Raymond Gilmetti's studies. How come? Because they might have nightmares. No, they can't have nightmares. They're incapable of having nightmares. They don't even know what a nightmare is. They'll never know what a nightmare is. But they will now because of Fukushima. They will now because the whole world is about to turn on nuclear. They will now because it's 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 the only option we got left. 
It's the only hope we got left on this planet is to shut it all down. But we got to stop the reactors in Japan. Chernobyl only lasted 10 days. Look what that done. You still can't eat the meat or drink the milk or sell the land in parts of Ireland, Scotland, UK. And Switzerland opened its fishery two years ago after a 28-year freshwater ban because of Chernobyl. Chernobyl was nothing. But there's so many people out there whose jobs depending upon law in the EU, whose jobs depend upon nuclear existing. There's a million corporations dependent upon nuclear. And all of them will perpetrate the law out there that's like a banana or like a potato chip. And, but there's no one to hold them accountable. There is no one to hold them accountable. And like, what I say is what I flushed out. What I say is, is 25,000 supporting documentations. What I say is 200,000 pictures of the Canadian coastline. Unbelievable amount of underwater footage. What I say is based upon pure fact, based, up, based upon proper documentation, based upon proper ways of, of assessing the information, and based upon the, the bitter reality that has been uh, watered down and diluted, uh, attempts to water it down and dilute it for 70 years by claiming that it was harmless, by claiming that it was benign or innocuous, and by claiming that it's like a banana or, you know, and there's no one, they're not, they're, they're, they know what they're doing. They're not making a mistake. They never read some bad information and said, oh yeah, that seems normal and put that in there. No, that's their policy. That's their ideology. That's the only way they can get a job at a, a university or an institution or a nuclear power site is if they're uh, mentally deficient, if they're missing um, the emotional capacity, they can get the job, and then they can be molded, employed to whatever way, because that's what they do. We, we show so many examples of the experts, people who even treat people for cancer with chemotherapy, and people who treat uh, transplant uh, with uh, full body irradiation because we won't even try to find another way to do it. Well, it's got to be nuclear. We'll get it. Dr. Raymond Kilmet, he never tried to cure dogs a single time for 35 years because you couldn't. Because once the, the animal is sequesters in the muscles of the organs or the bones, how are you going to get it out? How are you going to find it? And because there's so much of it, because they don't, they're not uh, accountable, and that they have arrogance, they have contempt for you, they have this demonic presence about them, that they're somehow uh, elevated because they got a job at a university, and that their job is to lie to you. I, I'm not lying to you. I'm telling you the truth. I'm warning you. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help this planet. I'm trying to help this world. That's what I'm here for. That's what he sent me here. To make this world a better place, right? I'm, only, I'm a visitor to this fucking planet as far as I'm concerned. My job is to get this planet on the right track. Even if you won't listen to me, to bludge him into submission with morals. To show him what they've done. To, to help them find a way forward. That's my job. That's how I see it. I'm a steward of eight million species. I'm, I'm here to protect them. I'm here to fight for them. I'm here to, to put my back against the wall for them. I'm here to say no to the thugs and the straw men and the money men and the, and the, the people out there that take great joy in destroying everything that is worth saving. Like Dr. Raymond Gilmet, he has no remorse. He went up on TV, KRQE, Channel 13, like you see there right now, who, by the way, called me a conspiracy theory for saying WIP had a radioactive release, not a, a truck fire. Because to me, a truck fire didn't make any sense. Why would you evacuate a mine for 10 days with a truck fire? You get on the other side of the truck because the ventilation is sucking all the smoke one way and you put it out. You get a tow truck, you bring in a flat deck and you throw it on the flat deck and you drive it out. 
They do it with transport trucks all day long. They couldn't do it with a truck. And they had to abandon the mine for 10 days and now they still can't get back down there. Because after 10 days apparently there was a release. But see the lawyer, right? They show you a unit four, perfect, but the building's actually destroyed. It's no different than what whipped on you. It's no different than what they've done to every nuclear site and every nuclear power plant. And every time there's an accident. It's just a handful of people doing it to us. But then the media allows them to get away with it. The medium is incapable because they're, that's the game. That's how they make their money, by coming out and covering up for corporations. Right? And then corporations do all kinds of advertising, and that's their kickback. It's not a it is a direct if you had if you were a little fly on the editor's wall, I can assure you, it would make incredible sense for you all of a sudden. If you could hear those words, if you could understand those words, and if you knew the difference. See, I know the difference. Most people who don't understand Fukushima at all, or not aware of Fukushima, probably won't know the difference. Otherwise, they would have been aware of Fukushima. And so, let me put it to you this way. When Fukushima blew up, a lot of people knew that. Harvard, MIT, Stanford, and I played those videos from the, the 14th, the 15th, and the 16th of March. Within five days, the three biggest institutions, um, well, MIT done it in, in uh, the next month, April 11th, on the first anniversary. But the... Um, but here they were telling you it was all destroyed and that there was big releases and meltdowns of the common spent fuel pool, the storage pools and everything else. But so all the potassium iodine, K forty, was sold almost right around this planet and you were back ordered all of a sudden for months. Because there was a lot of people out there who understood what this was all about. There was a lot of people who was aware since Three Mile Island or since Chernobyl and become educated and articulate and had warned people and then people had took that warning and went out and tried to ascertain uh, the potassium 40s and they couldn't because it was bought up right around the planet or it was given to the government to use for themselves but see that's not going to save you that's not actually going to help you but it does show that everybody was trying it showed the concern it showed that uh, there was enough people out there that they they, they they bought up everything on the market within 24 hours around this planet. So there was enough people that knew the difference. Most of these would have been nuclear plant managers and nuclear scientists and university professors. They would have scooped it all for themselves and their loved ones. And come out the next day and told you it was like a banana. My cigarettes don't got 7,000 chemicals. I know it still makes me a bad person for smoking. Thank you for telling me that. But my smokes don't got 7,000 chemicals. Did you remember that part? So it's just nicotine. But for all these decades you've been telling us now, how many studies, how many billions of dollars in studies have they done to try to link nicotine to cancer? They still can't do it. King's College in the UK was the last one to try it. I blogged it out there two years ago. They made big headlines and I responded to it. And I showed, you know, this industry is crazy, it, that your media never told you nothing about nuclear, tells you like a banana, and they tell you that nicotine is bad for you, yet it's the 7,000 chemicals, not the nicotine. The nicotine actually might be good for you. Might be one of the reasons why they're attacking it with 7,000 chemicals. See, if you look at nuclear, ultimately you end up discovering is that they're attacking water. And what is water? Water is life. Without water you die, I die, we all die, the plants die, everything on this planet will die without water. They can't reproduce without water or moisture, right? But what is nuclear really truly doing though? Nuclear is all built right on the coastlines. So it's sucking up a million gallons a minute per reactor and then each glass, like this glass of water, of salt water, would have a billion creatures and 75 to 100 million and more of them would be phytoplankton, the basis of the food chain, the carbon sequestration and the oxygen chain. 50% of the oxygen comes out of the ocean from water from the phytoplankton 
working with the sun. And so nuclear, because all the 440 nuclear reactors, it consumes water, radiates it, and releases it back into the environment as hot water. And we know one plant down in America killed three, three plus million fish in one year in front of its intake gates. Think about that one. Three million fish, never even got a fine. But it sucks up one point, um, don't call me, 1.27 billion gallons, billion gallons a day for all of its reactors. And then uh, 45 million gallons out of the 1.27 billion gallons 45 million gallons goes back into the river or the ocean as warm water, but it's sterilized. So 16 million glasses times a billion creatures a minute. So 16 million times a billion is how much each reactor is killing every second or every minute, 24 hours a day, 1,440 minutes a day. That's, how, that's the only reason it exists, is because it has to have all this water a million gallons a minute. And you'll find conflicting numbers out there where they've been muddling the water for the last couple of decades. But if you do your research like I have done, if you're as focused as I am, if you accumulate as much as I have, then you only talk to stuff you know for sure that you can recite in perfect unity because why bother, right? Why bother talking about something you're not sure of when you have such a vast knowledge uh, at you and that you have such a vast... Uh, once you've got the knowledge, it's easy to find out everything else in context for most things. But when it comes to nuclear, there's around 10,000 classified isotopes. But in nature, we have less than 160. The sun creates about 160. Now, everything that we create is supposed to be locked up, but we can't lock it up because it's a noble gas. And it'll blow up as sure as the buildings blew up, as sure as Whip blew up, as sure as Hanford. Now, Hanford is in the nose, right? Hanford Waste Repository. And Hanford is on the Columbia River. Hanford has been around for 70 years. Hanford had the first couple of reactors in North America. But Hanford, uh, recently we've got about 50 people violently sick, like violently sick, from breeding what they call fumes. The media calls it fumes at a nuclear waste site. Not breeding nuclear waste, but fumes. And fumes could be anything, right? Somebody farted, whatever. Because most people don't, they don't understand that there's so much more to that story. Well, for starters, there's 177 one million gallon containers there, right? Around 50 of them were leaking five years ago. But a lot more have leaked since. But in the ground, they've dumped uh, around 45 billion gallons directly into the soil. And they have 41 miles down there of open pits. This is above and beyond the 177 tanks that they got down there, million gallon tanks. They were only built the last couple of years for the glass, I call it glassification. It's not, I know it's not it's vitrification or whatever you want to call it. You know, ninny me all you want, yell at me all you want. Danny don't even know how to pronounce it. No, because there's so many aspects and facets to the industry, you can't keep up with it. But how it works though is you take glass and you put radioactive waste in there that's solidified and you let the glass cool down. Now it's locked in glass. And the theory was they were going to put it at Yuka Mountain and it'd be sitting in a chunk of glass. But see, because if you go look up Rad Chick, Christina Consolo, or you look up uh, Lorraine Moret, uh, the interviews on Wigner effect, you find out how long that glass is actually going to last. Like Lorraine Moret, repeatedly, over and over and over, this is a person under enormous stress. And you can't, you can't judge her. Trust me. You cannot judge that person. She has done more for humanity than I can shake a stick at for the rest of my life. She's under attack constantly. She's... She's, she's extremely articulating. She's worked with some of the best people on the planet. 
But when she tells the story on each of these events as they happen, you find out the truth about a week later, you go back and revisit her material, you'll find out she was bang on. Her predictions were bang on every time. I've seen that so many times. But her and Radchick, Christina Consolo, you'll find Radchick on YouTube. Just look up R-A-D and then Chick, C-H-O-I-C-K. They have a series there to call Wigner Effect. And they explore all types of radiation, man-made radiation, not necessarily the highest level radiation. But even the lowest level radiation causes the Wigner Effect. And the Wigner Effect uh, breaks down the molecules, the atoms, it breaks down their bond with each other. And then at some point, if it's under tension or stress, it'll let go. It'll let go. Hey, buddy. I'm a lot better. I decided to go stream it. Streaming. I'm streaming right now. That was the only, that was the only thing I can come up with. I'm going to come out and share it and have a chat with everybody. Okay. Thanks, buddy. I'll call you later. Yeah. There's Rapture checking to see how I'm doing. And so the Wigner effect. So think about this. If this is radiation, this is going to radiate that. Now it could be this far away. And think about how that works. Say that's radiation. Now the stuff we're talking a thousand, a millionth of a meter. So take a meter, divide it by a million. Take one of those and divide it by 10,000. And so if that's in your body and you've got a Geiger counter, I can read that right here, no problem at all. I can certainly read it right here with the Geiger counter. It blasted right through my body and then the Geiger counter picked it up. It would have kept on going a lot further. But anyway, the Geiger counter picked it up. Okay. Now, if that radiation wasn't in my body, it was like on something. Do you think it's still not pulsing at that energy? But if it's in your body, your body's attacking it relentlessly for the next couple of decades, white blood cells. So your spleen and your, and your joints. Now, you can read that on a Geiger counter. You can also be irradiated by that if you're sleeping next to somebody. Or their clothing or their blankets or their car seat gets irradiated. No different than a screwdriver and a battery. All of a sudden, a screwdriver is a magnet. Yeah? Well, that's what radiation does with everyday things in your life. It, it irradiates them. And so now that can radiate something else, and that can radiate something else, and that can now radiate something else. Now what if Fukushima really did happen? What if the fallout is through the entire planet? What if everything is coded, including the human species? And we know this because uh, California, an uh, institution has showed over 1,500 sulfur peroxide hydrogen buckyballs this was from spraying salt water in the reactor and you create these little these little buckyballs and I'll give you a shape to look at kinda looks like those shapes there and it's able to ingest the thousands of isotopes because you're, talk, you're normally told about iodine, you're normally told about cesium you're normally told about innocuous and harmless stuff on top of that but you're normally, if you're told about anything serious like cesium and iodine they are tracers. Well, they can be ingested. Then that becomes a nuclear engine. But it's so tiny, you can't see it. You can put two million on the head of a needle. If you've got a Geiger counter, that'll be two million counts per minute. Or a second. Who knows? Depending on how much energy they got. Depending on how many isotopes they had them. Now, everything that comes out of a chain reaction, out of a nuclear reactor, Everything, without the accident, everything is created from uranium or and the plutonium combination. And everything is supposed to be in a sarcophagus till the end of time. Everything that came out of there. 
has no context with the stuff in nature. Even though they gave it the same atomic number, they gave it the same atomic weight, they gave it the same atomic name sometimes. Everything that came out of a chain reaction is from a chain reaction. It's an ionizing, deadly radiation. There is no safe level of it. There is nothing safe about it. And that is why they lie to you. That is why they manipulate you. That is why they viciously and vehemently attack me relentlessly. That is why they, they hate me with so much passion. That is why they burn so much time and energy trying to demonize me. That is why they took down 300 of these presentations. But a court order. Now I was arrested just before that. And that then I was given a court order to take down those 300 videos. But get a load of this. I was arrested for what I said on two videos. Those two videos, I didn't get a court order to take down. Those two videos, when I got out of jail, were striked from my YouTube account by ghost accounts. But yet they used a court order to make me purge 300 videos off my site. Now, does that not sound weird to you? Why wouldn't they use a court order to take down the two videos that I'm charged with uh, for assault? I'm charged for saying something about two scientists with assault, criminal charge. And I got two more court appearances coming up. And I've made five in different jurisdiction. And so they didn't use a court order to take down the videos I'm charged with. They used a court order to take down the videos like this here that talk about Fukushima. So they came after me to get rid of my videos to take down these presentations. I bet today is not the number one presentation, I know. I get that. And anybody caught the beginning of the video can understand why it's not one of my normal days. But, you know, I know I had to come out and blog today. I understood I, had, I better do that because I might never show up again if I didn't. I might never open my mouth again if I didn't. And that is true. That is true, because there's a loneliness here now that is never, I'm never going to get used to being by myself, right? Like that. Now you can replace my friend, and that was a friend that consoled me many times. And so I cannot, I can't replace that, and no matter what I want in my life. Nothing can replace that, and, I, and everybody understands that emotion, everybody knows that feeling, everybody, I'm sure, uh, can tell me much much more pain than what anything I can express. But what I'm saying is, it is that moment in my life where I, I took something really painful in my life, and I understood that I can benefit the world by utilizing that properly, by understanding that, and being gracious about it, my experience with that, and not, not, not losing that aspect of it. And that's what the blog was about today. It was about me hanging on to my sanity, hanging on to the reality, and, and coming out and then just stand the ground again. No matter what, they, what happens to me, what they throw at me, I'm going to come back every time. And then if I don't, by that time I have educated enough people because they take me out, they kill me or something. And we know that's going to happen at some point. They're going to try to do that, or they're going to do that, or they've already tried to do it a number of times on the expedition, right? They demonized me at all the hotels and told people I was a, a rip-off artist while I was on the ocean, on the expeditions. Said I wasn't out there, said I was hid away somewhere, partying and everything else. When that's the last thing I, will, I would ever do. I don't live that life. My life is exactly what you see. My life is exactly what we talk about. And... You know, I, d I not only went out and had a look, I'd done the entire coastline, 15,000 miles, 260 days. And we documented up, up at the nuclear proctologist. But to me, it's not enough. See, that's the problem with me, right? And that is a problem for the people that support me, I'm sure. Because people can't just burn money forever. It, it comes back and gets them at some point. And then I don't have enough people to support me to do the things that need to be done, but I push people so fucking hard to, to, to give me and help me do what I need, what I feel I have to do. It's always been like that, see? 
I felt I had to go out and look at the coastline. I had to see it myself. I had to be convinced because I understood it. I dove 14,000 hours under the ocean. I know the ocean extraordinarily well. I've worked every ocean industry in both oceans. I know it extremely well. And I excelled in every one of them too. And I ran over a commercial dozen, over a dozen boats on this coast alone. I worked both oceans nonstop my whole life. But see, what I was missing was the most important part of everything that would drive me that little bit further, would always give me that extra energy, would always make me try harder, was the one thing that I didn't understand. And that was the loss. See? I got the loss because I seen everything missing on the coastline. That was my loss. But it didn't impact me the same way it's supposed to, it's supposed to impact me for some reason. Because I was doing all these expeditions, who knows? But how many more must suffer the same misery and agony and heartaches and heartbreaks before we get it right? How many more times must we recycle this planet before we actually get it right? Are we on our last cycle? Is what we should ask ourselves. Is this the last miracle around, miracle call around for humanity where we, we need to buckle down and get it right? We need to buckle down and deal with it. We need we need to stop the reactors in Japan. We need to stop all the other reactors. We need to work hard on alternative technology for energy. And that's all doable. We produced 4,300 peer review academic studies are published in the journals every day. Sounds like a lot, don't it? Well, they all go to the basic big three, Elsevier, Springer, and Wiley. And they get the copyrights from all your universities for free. And you don't get to read it. It goes beyond a paywall. And then the academics who publish it, what do they end up with? Six people might have read their study because they published it. And no one can afford to fucking buy it. Excuse the language. And it's locked up beyond a paywall forever. And we don't utilize that because it's locked up beyond a paywall. It's private property now. and But that that is a private corporation. They got the copyrights. To our, we paid for the institutions, we paid for the tenors, the universities, the equipment, we sent our loved ones there, we paid the wages, we paid the tuitions, right? We paid in bailouts every year to all these institutions. In Canada, we give like $35 billion a year to the universities. And every one of the studies, bar none, they're locked up beyond the paywall. How will we ever, because if they weren't, they wouldn't be able to pull the wool over your eyes like they're doing. If they, you wouldn't be eating the GMO. You wouldn't be looking at nuclear. You wouldn't be wasting your time on the Ninian because you would have the documentation to be able to come in and have a conversation. But because that's hit away, you're resorted to Ninian. You're resorted to name calling. You're resorted to left, right, center, middle, extreme, far left, Pol Pot, now. You're, you're, you live in a democracy where 51% can take away the rights of 49, when before you had a republic where everybody was entitled to their space and their freedoms and their liberties. And now nobody has none. You have a private corporation printing your money in North America, called the Federal Reserve, it's a private company. It's in the yellow pages alongside the Federal Express. And all they got to do is go bankrupt and open up another Federal Express and start printing money again. All they do, they're just a company there are no different Hallmark cards printing out cards. They're printing out money. That's, and they're not supposed to be doing it. And so they can print out airplanes and they have a money, cash, and send it to dictators. Or send it to warlords so they can buy the weapons off them. Because they have and they will and they continue to do it. Just like 10,000 Taliban got millions dead, millions missing, millions of refugee camps in each country. Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and now Syria with 13 million. And now we want to import them all over the world. We don't want them to go back. We want to send them all over the world. What do we do the next time? We bring them all to our country too? What about the next time? Why not hold the people accountable and let them go home? Why not stop the war? Why go after 10,000 people and, and create 13 million refugees? 10,000 people could never do that. 10,000 people try to march through a city and then everybody went out to get them. They'd be gone. But 10,000 figments of your imagination, 
then you can wreck a country and you can fire 5.5 million rounds a month, you can justify 290,000 rapes over nine years, you can justify 5 million orphans, some way or another. And it's justified through your universities verbatim, talking about the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, it's just verbatim throughout your media by them talking about it, just bringing it up. Never mentioning that, well, you know, we got millions dead, millions missing, you know, to get 10,000 people, we fired 5.5 million rounds a month, you know, I suppose we're doing something wrong, you know, I suppose we've been hoodwinked, but that is your, that is your litany, that is your history. That is your fucking repertoire for the rest of your life if you choose not to become uh, a resistance, to become part of the people who, like, you know, these people have families. All of these people have friends. All of these people have loved ones. All of these people have their favorite bars. All of these people have their favorite restaurants. All of these people are accessible. All of these people, somebody has their ear in their, you know. And so they have to lie to all of these people all the time, in every aspect of their life. And so when nuclear, when you finally find out over the next short while that Fukushima has killed the Pacific Ocean, is bye bye planet, what do you think all these pro nuclear industry people and corporate personhoods and, and industries, and companies, and employees, and, and uh, admirers are going to be saying when they realize that for the last 70 years they've been lied to and that everything they've been told by their friends and their families and their loved ones who work in the industry is just a big fat stupid lie and it was an insult they insulted their loved ones and their friends by lying to them they, that's, that's the same thing as calling them moron because they know they didn't know the difference so they just say oh it's like a banana it's like walking in sunshine and all you people here today, and your comments will all disappear when the video is posted. That's what Google does, right? Google gets rid of all the comments. There could be a thousand comments here right now. You'll never know it when this video shows up after. Google won't reinstall the comments, right? They won't read, like they used to always do that. Yeah, and I would, I get a thousand, two thousand, three thousand comments sometimes on a stream, yeah? Many times. Hundreds of videos like that. And what happened? Google, when, when the live stream was over, the comments would all show up. But for, now it don't show up no more. Now there's no comments there. It's got all the thumbs up. People come look at the video. It's been up a couple of minutes because that's what the live stream does after we repost it. People will come and say, well, data's cheating. You got all kinds of thumbs up. <laughs> Video's only been up a minute. You got 60 thumbs up or something. Right, we've seen that over and over and over. But that's the industry coming in, they're taking a kick at you while you're down. On purpose, they've done that on purpose. Got rid of all the comments on purpose. So people wouldn't come back and, and talk and, and listen some more or learn something else, see? Because comments would normally drag you back. But the nuclear industry is crazy. If the comment from a nuclear industry drags you back is because it drove you crazy. It's because you got a lying sack of shit. Because you got someone there who don't care. Because you got some people there that are there to lie to you and trick you and your friends and your families for a living. So that they can't wake up, so they can't understand. So that the fable lives for another day. And at this rate, the planet is gone, yeah? We already lost the Pacific Ocean. We've lost it. It's down to nothing. Everything left has died and disturbed to death. The, the biota, everything is gone. The insects are gone from the shoreline, except for a tiny percentage. If you're lucky to find it at all. All the mammals and animals that are on the coastline, they emaciated themselves over the last three years and died. There's a, I showed you a video a couple of days ago where they suspect all 3,000 polar bears in Antarctica that they know about, all of them will be dead in the next short while because for the last three years they're all emaciated. See, that's what people don't, people don't see that world. They don't understand that side of it for some reason. Let me see if I can. I think I might have a picture of those polar bears right here. No, I don't. Just as well.
Okay, well, hugs everybody, radical, home goddess, Andrew, Shani Ken, hugs honey. We know you suffered just tremendously. It's somebody that I often say, well, I ain't got as bad as Elaine does. I shouldn't, I'm not talking about this morning, honey, at all. I'm just saying, people out there don't understand suffering until they met Elaine, trust me. Now, I'm not going to do it to her, but just cruising, Lawrence, Amthurst. Hi, everyone. Lawrence Taylor, Shanikins. Jason Cody. Oomph. We're signing off. Your comments will be gone. That's probably the biggest heartache here today. I won't get to read all your comments. But I was scanning them. I was scanning them. And I will copy whatever is here right now. And, and put them in a folder. Because it's one of those streams that should never happen, right? And that's how I see the stream. It's one of those streams that should have never took place. I should have been on the ocean. And we lost Zoe this morning, so I'm, I'm back ashore for a few days. I'm not sure if I'm going back out. I probably am. There's too much work to be done. And it's the right thing to do. It's just that like anybody else in, you know, in your life, you have these times, you have these trials, and you have these tribulations, and it's what you do next that makes or breaks you, right? I decided I was going to live stream out today because I understood the importance of getting back on the bicycle and start riding at a crucial point and appreciate it, how good it is to ride a bicycle. Because if you forget how nice it is, you'll never ride the bike again, right? I don't know if that's a good analogy, but as far as I know, I'm the only person on the internet that is able to really walk to walk, talk to talk, and does that, providing the documentation as I'm talking generally, not like today, but is able to provide the documentation while they're talking. They no, I don't lose track of things. It's on my computer, 95% of it I can find it, even though I haven't seen it for years. I know which folder, exactly where it's to, and even what. And what I do, I'll just end it on that, is I have a little trick is um, I'm able to visualize what it looks like, what the picture is, or the colors and stuff like that. And that's that big trick I use. And I can recall information that is so obscured and, and has been buried and never looked at. And they say, oh yeah, I got that in the folder. And it's like, like, like. <laughs> there it is. My friends, and they laugh their ass off sometimes. Because when I say, oh no, hang on, they know. Dana's going to find it. And if not, I can find it on the internet sometimes quicker. I can remember exactly where it's to. But it's a visual thing with me. I, I visually see it. I visual, it's, like, it's like a big picture right in front of me, literally. Except it's a little foggy, but it's very visual. That's why I am like I am, maybe. But to me, it's a very visual thing. It's almost like numbers sometimes. I, I see that too. But I, I instantly know exactly at that point now where it's to. That's the trigger for me. Like I'm trying to remember where it's to and then I have a visual. It's bizarre land. But I don't see anybody out there, not necessarily like that, but anybody out there that is really able to, to put a foot in the nuclear mouth and snap off a few jaws while he's doing it. And I know that sounds pretty violent. But if you look at the violence that they have caused, and the misery and the agony and, and just the, the heartaches that are coming, you might just understand one one millionth of what I just said in that sentence, what I meant in that sentence, of how bad these people are. They know what they're doing. They're not stupid. And when they tell you it's like a banana or a potato chip or walking in sunshine, well, what they've done to you was they stabbed you and slapped you in the face, and they... they they disrespected you. And to me, that is the lowest of the lowest, right? I don't dis I didn't disrespect those people originally. I went out and I listened to what they had to say, and then I went out and sourced out what they said, and I found out they were lawyers. And then I called them on it. 
And so I'm not a bad person for doing that. And neither is anybody else. Hugs for everybody. Take your radical. Amthurst. Netty Neff. Yeah, my heart goes out to you. Eugene, Julie. It's, it's okay, folks. Trust me. It's okay. I just know that today wasn't a good day for me to do something like this, but today was a good day for me to do something like this. And maybe I'm the only person who understands that. And so I have to take my chances, right? Hugs for everybody. Dana loves you. We'll be back soon enough. Um, if not tomorrow, I'll be back Monday anyway. We'll see everybody then. Take care, folks. We'll see you tomorrow. Um, I'm sorry on Monday.